Hello, good Fulcrum Knights and those who have yet to join the Order. It is Star Wars Red Harvest Audiobook Part 5. I am Harry, your reader. You can follow the channel on Twitter at Fulcrum underscore ENT. And my friends, if you've joined in this audiobook and you want to find the start or you want to browse our other audiobooks in the description, you will find links to all of our playlists. This is a channel where we like to interact with our fans, so let's say hello to people in the comments. Lben42 has raised something very important. He says, How come no other zombies have ever used their own head as a projectile weapon? That is such a great idea. And very kindly says he's got to check out my band, so there's some pretty dope tunes in the last video. Thank you very much. We got a copyright claim for that. It's my own. I made that. I recorded that, and we still got a copyright claim. It's all been resolved now, we haven't lost any money and we haven't had to take anything down, but hey, just another sign of the crazy world that is YouTube. Tony Vlashin has come in and said, I think the Jedi is going to get bit. Now that's a really interesting idea, Tony, because if the Jedi gets bit and it already has a psychic link with the orchid that's been used to make the virus, what will that do? Will there be some kind of super intelligent zombie? Maybe one that can use force powers like a regular Jedi? And our good friend Googe in the comments says, I've got a feeling the bounty hunter will be a warrior. An interesting theory. It does seem like there might be more to this whippid than meets the eye and more to his past. I wonder if something will be exposed about him later in the story. There is only one way to know, however, and that is reading. So, let's begin. Chapter 23. Low Boy. Where is everybody? That was what Kendra had asked Rart when they were outside, and he'd blown it off, or pretended to, because he didn't have an answer, or because the answer he had was too deeply disturbing to vocalise. But the question returned to him now, down in the dorms, as they went through room after room, finding nothing but empty, silent bunks and vacant corridors. They had been running for some time, but Kendra didn't even sound as if she was out of breath, and Rart realised that he was starting to feel better too. Moving around had helped clear his head, steadying him. Even his arm didn't hurt as much anymore. Being young had its advantages. Going low had been Kendra's idea a means of buying time until they figured out what they were up against, and despite Rart's avowed intention to go to the infirmary and get checked out, he'd followed her. For now, anyway. They'd run inside a long utility corridor to a place where it branched off in a three-pronged intersection. The permasteel ceiling oozed condensation just above him, and the long tube lamps embedded in the walls let off a pale, achromatic glow in the hanging clouds of moisture. The opposite end of the corridor intersected another group of dorms, and that was there they'd run into two other students, Hartwig and Mags. What are you two doing down here? Hartwig asked. He frowned at Rart. Dag, man, what happened to your arm? Training accident? Rart said evenly. Hartwig smirked. Fail. Meaning what? Meaning that? Hartwig pointed at the wound. Doesn't look like any training accident I ever saw. What did you do? Fall on a vibroblade or something? I was in the pain pipe. Rart held Mags and Hartwig in the same regard that he did the rest of his classmates, with a kind of suspicious indifference. Their motives were purely selfish, as were his. He had no intention of sharing information that didn't somehow improve his own situation. At this point, they all knew something had gone very wrong, contaminating the Academy or the entire planet. For the moment, they were allies of opportunity. Have you guys seen anything else down here? What do you mean, anything? Hartwig gasped. Or anybody? No. Mags cracked his knuckles nervously. Not yet. Weird, huh? It's pretty early for it to be so quiet. I heard there was some kind of assembly earlier, but Wig and I missed it. If we're going any farther, Kindra cut in, we're going to need weapons. Our best bet is dividing up. 
She pointed up ahead, where the corridor pronged into three separate halls. Searching these hallways in groups of two and... Wait a minute, Hartwig said. Who put you in charge? In charge? Kindra turned, and Rart saw that she was staring directly at Hartwig. Her grey, almost translucent irises like newly formed frost. Nobody asked you to tag along. Her eyes flashed off Rart. Any of you. Hartwig shrugged uneasily. Yeah, I'm just saying. What? We all feel some kind of bad in the air, right? Like maybe some kind of disease? But who's to say it's not just one of Scabbers' drills? Kindra's eyebrows went up. Excuse me? For all we know, he started this himself. Why, maybe it's a training exercise, Mags put in. Or maybe he's calling the weak students. It's happened before. Remember the Unaki eye spiders? This is worse, Kindra said. Don't be so sure, Hartwig said. Eleven students went blind. Two of them died. Remember Soid Enray? Soid Enray was a defective already. Maybe, but he still hung himself afterward. And then we found out that Scabrous had reactivated the fertilized spider's eggs from the pathogen bank as a nerve reflexivity drill. Hartwig refused to lower his stare. I still wake up with blood in my eyes sometimes. Kindra's expression didn't change. What's your point? You want weapons? I might know where we can find some, but I'm not going to risk getting into trouble with the masters if nobody's actually seen anything. Hartwig waited for a response, looking at Kindra, then at Rart, and then finally let out a derisive snort. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. He turned to go. I'll see you puss bags around. Wait, Rart said. I saw something. Hartwig stopped and turned to look at him. Rart saw Kindra's tongue come out and moisten her upper lip, listening expectantly. Two bodies fell out of Scabrous's tower, Rart said. They hit the ground. I saw them hit. I heard the noise they made. They were dead. He swallowed. His throat was suddenly very dry. But then they got up. Mags and Hartwig were both staring at him now with various degrees of scepticism and outright disbelief. Rot discovered that he didn't care. Let them doubt. It would only make them better cannon fodder when the time came. Were you all alone when you saw this? Kindra asked. I was sparring with Lusk. Mags blinked at him, and Hartwig's eyes grew wide. Maybe it was just Rart's imagination, but he thought the mention of Lusk's name brought a paradoxical shiver of credibility to the moment. It was too unlikely a detail to be made up. One of the ones who fell was Wim Nictor, Rart said. After he hit the ground, he got up and attacked me. He was dead, but he was still alive. I had to pin him under a pile of rocks to get away. Out with the rest of it, then, he decided. That sickness in the air that you're talking about, that Scabrous is doing. Up in the tower, I think. He swallowed again, and this time his voice was steadier. I think he's bringing the dead back to life. There was a sharp rattle of footsteps from somewhere in front of them. Rart felt a sudden feeling of coolness rising up inside of him as if his skin were being stretched by gallons of cold water. When he spoke, his voice seemed to be transmitting from somewhere far away. Which way is it coming from? Cocking her head, Kindra pointed up ahead, where the main corridor divided into three sub-corridors, to the one that branched on the left. Up there, she whispered. You hear it? Rat's ears strained for sound. At first he heard nothing. Then they all did. A dragging, grating clank. It was advancing down the walkway with a graceless lack of stealth, growing steadily louder with every passing second. Rart began concentrating solely on himself and his own survival, forgetting all the others. 
The masters of the academy had trained them to fight as a unit when necessary. But a Sith warrior's true strength lay in his or her own personal will to power. When you could trust no one, fighting alone was axiomatic, a natural state. Flattening himself to the wall, he felt the force's dark side coursing through him, a crackling, electric chill that rendered fear and apprehension obsolete and welcomed it. In that moment, he felt only a ready vigilance, weightless and unrelenting. Since arriving here on Odessa Faustin, it was the closest to happiness that he dared let himself experience. Yet, in so many ways, it was superior to any happiness he'd ever encountered. It made traditional happiness look anemic by comparison. All at once, he realized that he could see what was coming, not with his eyes, but in his mind. Relax, he breathed. It's okay. Kindra wrinkled her forehead, about to reply, when the droid rattled from the end of the tunnel, stopped, and regarded them dully. It was a bare-bones Sigma series training unit, eight-armed, with belt treads and a force-feedback intelligence implant so rudimentary that it was practically a piece of furniture. Rot hadn't seen one like it since he'd run newbie lightsaber drills not long after his arrival here. Its copper-blue chassis was a dented utility cabinet, carbon-scored with hundreds of old marks from countless years of clumsy rookies. Heaving a sigh, Hartwig came away from the wall, watching the others emerge into view around it. "'What's that thing doing so far down here?' Mags muttered. The droid clicked and produced a series of broken-sounding words, its equivalent of speech. Equipping such a unit with a vocabulator would have been pointless. Rart reached down and grabbed a loose strip of alloy sealant dangling from its undercarriage, pried it off and wedged it directly underneath the thing's bulky central processor. He jammed the strip in as far as he could and twisted. What are you doing? Kindra asked. The processor cowl came loose with a snap. If I remember right, he said. This thing's still got a visual mapping system. He eased his right hand between two hot layers of components, which means it should still have a playback function, and whatever it's seen lately should still be stored somewhere in its memory bank. He didn't glance up. Master Yakata used to make us watch our old drills this way, remember? Yeah, Mag said. But... The space in front of them flickered and brightened with a cone of holographic blue light, the image sharpening, gaining resolution and depth. They all stood back looking at it, pale blue reflecting off their faces, none of them speaking. At first, Rart didn't quite realise what he was seeing. Mags was the first to break the silence. He sounded hoarse, as if he was still trying to whisper, but needed to clear his throat. What is that? Nobody answered. The hologram showed an area somewhere deep inside the tunnels where an indistinct mob of figures was teeming, not quite randomly, in the foreground. From their uniforms, Rat realised they were Sith acolytes. But there was something wrong about the way their bodies moved, a jolting, uneven pace, and he couldn't see their faces. From this angle, it was impossible to tell how many there were. All he could see was that they were hunched together, working over what looked like a massive pile of debris, shoving and piling and dropping it into place in the corridor ahead of them. Within just a few moments, the pile in the tunnel had grown noticeably higher. The light on the other side was narrowing to a thin band. What are they doing? Mags asked. Rart's voice was a non-specific whisper. Building a wall. Maybe it's some kind of barricade, Hartwig said, so they can hold off whatever's out there. He caught his breath. It must be. Look, Rart pointed the hologram. The angle's changing. Maybe they've got weapons we can use. Mags was sounding excited now. 
Yeah, look, that one's got a lightsaber. He was already heading up in the direction the droid had come. Let's move. Wait, Rot said. What? Max turned around, frowning. What's wrong? Rot was still looking at the hologram. The droid had broadened its field of view, dumping on bandwidth, and the image's signal-to-noise ratio had improved dramatically. Now the blue light cone showed a huge mob of bodies, dozens of them, more than he could even count, crammed together in front of the barrier. It looked like half the students at the academy were packed into that part of the tunnel. Rat pointed. Their faces. Mags came back, hardly paying attention. I don't see what, he said, and stopped. Oh no. Several of the Sith students in the hologram were turning and looking directly back at the droid. Their faces were slack and vacant, devoid of any emotion. It was the exact same way that Nicta had looked up on top of the overhang. Rat saw that some of them had wounds on their faces and necks, and their uniforms were badly torn, hanging from their torsos like bloody sails. He watched as one of them, a student whose name he couldn't remember, brought his face directly up to the droid's holocam, a sly grin peeling over his lips. Like Nictor, Rat murmured, and felt Kindra stiffening next to him in his peripheral vision. Hartwig said, What? There's light on the other side of that barricade, Roth said. But that's it. So what are they doing? Roth looked back at him. They're walling us in. A good chapter to start the video there. We are already seeing that coordinated action that was so distinct of the zombies in Star Wars Death Troopers. And it makes me uh, think of uh, Taco No Tequila's comment, who said, I wonder if the zombies will be able to use lightsabers later. That would be amazing. Now, based on Death Troopers, I suspect, yes, they will. And in that last chapter, they said distinctly that one of the figures in there had a lightsaber. So I assume if any of the masters have been turned, they will have had their lightsaber on them. And I'm thoroughly expecting to see a zombie use it. In the comments, we also have Griefer Games, who in the last video said, I love this series. Red Harvest just keeps getting better. And has asked, do you have a favorite genre or do you like them all? Well, I do love a bit of horror. I very much enjoy a horror story. I've enjoyed uh, Resident Evil and these zombie uh, books here in Star Wars. However, here with Fulcrum Entertainment, I do want to respect our Star Wars roots as a channel and try and stick to a sort of sci-fi leaning thing, even when we're not not reading a Star Wars book. And let's say hello to Devin, a new knight. Said, found this channel through Death Troopers and I've been listening to all the Star Wars books on the channel. I plan on listening to the Mandalorian armor next. You earned yourself another knight. Welcome to the Order. Thank you very much. I'm glad you're enjoying the books. Okay, and now on to our next chapter, chapter 24, Seed. It was the Orchid that saved them. Looking back, Zoe hadn't even been aware of exactly what she was doing, although that by itself shouldn't have been a surprise. A good deal of a Jedi's power was instinctive, a function of the Force, but it didn't make the situation any less disturbing. The things beneath them had started clambering up the rock face with a kind of manic agility, clawing their way toward her and Tolk in spastic bursts of movement. The Whippet reacted first, drawing his spear and thrusting it straight at the first one, impaling it through the chest and then hauling it upright, using the thing's own weight to drag it down and finish the job. Tulk swung the spear around with the corpse still on it, bludgeoning the others, driving them back with a series of vicious thrusts. The plan went wrong almost immediately. Despite the fact that it had been run through completely, the thing at the end of the spear wasn't stopping. It wasn't even slowing down. And Zo realized the other corpses had changed their approach, climbing up onto the overhang from the other side, while Tulk was still struggling to kill the first one. The can't be killed, a voice whispered from the back of her mind. They're already dead. Look at them. 
At first she thought she was hearing her own thoughts, and then she realized it was the Murakami orchid, roiling in its own guilt and misery, gammering out words that she alone could hear. Dead but alive, Hestizo! Dead but alive! I did this to them! It was my fault! When Scabras put me into that horrible vat, and now I'm inside them! Zoe stiffened. That must have been when she made the connection, on some level at least, because a moment later she was staring straight at the dead thing wiggling on the end of Tulk's spear. Except it wasn't really at the end anymore. It had pulled itself forward until it was almost close enough to grab the Whippid's face. I've got an idea, she told the Orchid. Grow! What? You're in them now, she said. Aren't you? You're a part of them. You said so yourself. Thus, but... Then grow! I can't just... Don't argue with me, just grow! It might have been that last command, the desperate vehemence of it, that stirred the orchid to action. Zoe saw the thing at the end of Tulk's spear stiffen and then fall abruptly motionless, as if it had just realized something profoundly unwelcome was taking root inside it. An instant later, a thin, green tendril began to wind itself out of the thing's right ear extruding a vine that grew steadily thicker as it looped downward. Another vine appeared inside its left nostril, and then a third, and fourth. Storks and runners were snaking busily out of both ears now, some of them bearing small clusters of leaves, others tiny black flowers. The corpse's mouth opened, and another stork, this one as big around as Zoe's finger, bursts outward from its bloody throat. Hester's oh, this hurts! This hurts me! Grow, she told it. Grow! Just keep growing! Just grow! Looking around, she saw the others were experiencing the same effect, sprouting stalks and stems from every visible orifice. Their faces squirmed with thin, wiggling plant life just underneath the skin. Zoe knew that it was working now. The orchid was in them, and the orchid was growing. She concentrated harder. She could actually see the flora growing inside the things now, driving it harder, farther, faster from within. Even as the orchid began crying out, begging for her to stop, telling her that this hurt, it couldn't do it anymore. She ignored it and stared straight at the thing on Tog's spear. She thought the word again, thought it with all the intensity and determination she could muster, over and over in a smooth and solid thought wave. Grow, 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 grow! The corpse's entire cranial vault exploded in a colossal splat of red and black and green. In the space where its skull had been, a bright spray of leaves flapped and writhed, winding outward, spilling down to encompass the entire upper half of the thing's torso. The body fell limp, sagging on the spear. Tolk dumped the thing with a brisk, shoveling gesture, kicking it so that it barrel-rolled over the edge, and then glanced back at Zoe. You did that? Me and the flower. You better do it again. The whippet pointed over the edge of the overhang at the other things. They were still sprouting, Zoe saw, but not as quickly, clawing back upward toward them. Astuzo! Please! The orchid sounded weaker now. No more! Not now! I can't! It hurts! You have to, Zoe said, unaware that she was speaking out loud. You have to do it, because if you don't, they're not going to stop. They're going to kill us. They're going to kill me. Do you understand? So sorry, Hester Zoe. Silence. 
and it was gone. A hand closed around her ankle, jerking her forward from below. Zoe started to fall, landing on her side just as one of the things lurched upward, fully into view. She tried to pull away, but couldn't budge. Grow! she pleaded with the orchid. Grow! Grow now! But the flower, wherever it had gone, whatever its abilities had been just moments before, was of absolutely no help to her now. She couldn't even hear its voice anymore, and the writhing, rippling movement on the other thing's faces seemed to have stopped. There was nothing more they could do about them now. The orchid was tired, or absent, or dead. The thing on her leg was dragging her closer. What are you doing? Tolk shouted. He was stabbing furiously the others without much effect. Stop them! I can't! Zoe shouted back. The orchid's not here anymore! All at once, something huge burst up out of the ground in front of them. A monolith, black and featureless, hurling an enormous corona of rock and ice in its wake. From what Zoe could make out, it looked like a turret made of stone and durasteel, taller than the rocky outcropping where she was currently fighting for her life. Lights pulsed within it. As its domed upper mounting swung toward them, she saw the gleam of a heavy turbine. The blaster pulsed twice, and the corpse in front of her disappeared in an acrid spray. Zoe blinked, wiping her eyes, and a massive amount of strength and momentum slammed into her from behind. The whippet, she realized, knocking her off the top of the overhang just before the third blast pulverized it completely. They landed, faced first in the dirty snow. Zoe's ears ringing, her head splitting from the fusillade of laser blasts behind them. Massive hunks of smoking boulder and snow were showering down from above. Zoe stared back at the crater where they'd just been standing. Run! Tulk ordered. What? That way! He jerked his arm toward the long, hollowed-out, tube-like structure twenty meters in front of them. And when she didn't move, the whippet shoved her forward just as the laser cannon pivoted again, tracking straight for her. Oh, that was a pretty sweet chapter. Chapter 24 there, showing something that I didn't expect at all all in this book. That whole thing of using the plant within them to grow is pretty, pretty sweet. I liked that. And makes me think very interesting things, given that we know the library is full of a sentient plant creature. And I don't know if perhaps some similar shenanigans could go on there. Or could he become undead himself? And what would that be? So, comments as usual. Morgan Baylor, hello. Thank you very much for listening, as always. Says, reading Darth Bane would be really badass. I don't know if that's possible or not, but he seems like one of the most interesting Sith. And yes, plenty of people are talking about Bane and reading that series, and it, it's going to happen. We might have to get over uh, another book or two, because there are other books that people want to hear, but trust me, Bane is happening. And speaking of that, Halo Red V Blue says, Is there any possibility you might one day continue with the second and third books in the Bounty Hunter Wars trilogy? The first was so good. I have bought both of those books in paperback. Wasn't able to get them on ebook anymore for some reason. I did do the first one. So we have those. They are there ready. So I think we're going to be picking up with Slave Ship after we've done with Red Harvest, I think. Unless. I don't know, that book spontaneously combusts in the night or something? And Red Uchiha YT704 is adding to the interesting lists of things people do while listening to the audiobook and says this story is a very welcome background for building my Minecraft Death Troopers replica, which I find fascinating. Please, I'd love to hear more details of that. Are you making a replica of the Star Destroyer where the virus uh, broke out? Or perhaps a replica of the Prison Barge as well? It sounds like an excellent project. Now, the next two chapters are quite short, so I'll probably read those back to back without a break, guys. So here's chapter 25, Positive ID. Statement. The HK's voice crackled from inside the comlink. Sir, we located Hestizo Trace. 
The Sith Lord paused and adjusted the frequency until the connection became clear. He was standing in the bulkhead of the Myro Corps, having just finished a complete inspection of the vessel top to bottom. Locating the bounty hunter's ship had not been difficult. The tower's sensors had found it crash-landed two kilometres outside the academy, tracking it from the heat signature, and Scabrus had approached it with absolute stealth, on the off chance there might be someone aboard. But there was no sign of the Jedi or the Whippid who had brought her here. The craft had been abandoned. Where is she? he asked. Response. Initial perimeter scan reports positive identification on the northeast quadrant. Scanners registered a 98.3 positive pheromone match. How long ago? Response. Ten standard minutes, sir. Coordinate vector, 27 by 18, order of magnitude. Is she dead? The slightest of pauses. Response. Negative, sir. Per your orders. Good. Statement. Our mid-range scout systems report that she and the Whippet bounty hunter are traveling together, headed northwest toward the Tauntaun paddock in that near vicinity. They are still on foot and in all probability seeking immediate cover from the initial attack. The HK made a clicking sound, awaiting orders. Query. Shall I reactivate the perimeter cannons in that quadrant, set for stun? Scabrous didn't answer right away, thinking about the terrain the droid was describing. The tower itself wasn't far from there, of course, and... and the library. That won't be necessary, Scabrous said. I'll handle it personally. Statement. The droid sounded more tentative now. There is... something else. What is it? Several local sensors are reporting unverified cluster activity in various quadrants around the Academy in general. It's unclear exactly what the source of the activity is. Biorhythm diagnostics aren't reporting any verifiable vital signs. Then fix it. Clarification. The electronics themselves are online and functioning normally. It's the activity. It shows no sign of life body temperature, respiration, heart, or brain activity. Scabrous stopped and gazed thoughtfully at the Myrocore's dented metal bulkhead in front of him. For a moment, the only sounds were the low, steady hum of the hemodialysis machine pumping fresh blood through his body, and the surrogates of fluids whisking through tubes, feeding him the cocktail of antiviral drugs. How much activity? he asked. Response, unclear at present, the HK's voice said. But it seems to be... What? Well, it seems to be spreading, sir. I see. Scabrous thought of the apprentice, Nicta, or the thing that had once been Nicta, crawling out of its cage despite the fact that all vital signs registered negative. He thought about how the thing had lunged at him, and then gone after Jura Ostrogoth. The appetite that the thing had brought to bear. At that moment, Scabrus had assumed that what he'd seen was a kind of exaggerated nervous twitch, a biochemical accident that the drug and the orchid had triggered inside Nicta's body. But now... It seems to be spreading, sir, the HK had said. He began to reconsider. My lord, the droid prompted. Never mind that now, Scabrous said. I'm going directly to the library. There will be no need for lasers. Hestizo Trace will meet me there personally, and we shall finish our business together, she and I, as it was meant to be. Have my own ship prepared for immediate departure afterward. Yes, sir, but... Scabrous cut off the transmission and strode through the Myrocore's open hatch, down the landing ramp and out into the snowy night. Chapter 26 Sub-Zero 
In the first hour that Trace passed through the collapsed walls and stone temples of the academy, the blizzard around him only worsened. It was as if the planet itself had read his arrival as a kind of infection on the cellular level and was fighting him off however it could. The temperature, already freezing, continued to plunge until his throat and lungs burned with every breath. The wind roared between the massive boxy shapes of the buildings and substructures, the great slabs and half-submerged corridors. Its scream was wraith-like, endless, the cry of something hungry for more than simple meat. Even the pellets of snow themselves felt sharper, jagging into his skin like tiny bits of shrapnel from an endlessly recurring explosion. In his peripheral vision, a shadow twitched and slithered. Trace stopped, hand reaching back for his lightsaber. And that was when he saw the man stepping out of the arched doorway to his left. Even before Trace glimpsed the man's face, he sensed the thin, bitter smile twisted over his lips, the threat of violence in those half-lidded eyes. The man's tunic and cloak blew out behind him, snapping whip-like in the irregular gusts of wind, and his voice, when it came across the broken landscape between them, was a low snarl. You landed on the wrong world, Jedi. Trace turned and faced him directly. The man was a Sith master, that much was readily apparent, perhaps an instructor at the academy. I am Shockweth, Blade Master here on Odessa Fostin. I could only assume that you came here seeking humiliation and an unpleasant death. I am here on other matters. Ah! The Blade Master cocked his head slightly, looking marginally intrigued. But you found me instead. Trace nodded. Actually, it was only stillness that had found him. Clarity of thought, and it came as a blessing. The cold... The darkness, the stinging wind, all of these outside factors had simply ceased to exist. His entire world had shrunk to the exact distance between him and the man who stood before him, an obstacle in the way of finding Hestizo. Trace felt everything inside him begin to relax and flow smoothly as the force spread through his nerves and muscles, generating a kind of weightless balance between action and intent. He drew his own lightsaber and felt it blaze to life in his grasp, a perfect extension of himself. The Sith Master's response was immediate. With a harsh grunt of fury, he flew at Trace, vaulting upward in the wind and angling the blade down with both hands, ripping through the ground where Trace had just been standing. The execution was flawless. A thing of almost organic brutality, as if the Blade Master had become a force of nature, another component of the blizzard that roared around them. Yet he was still too slow. Leaping sideways, Trace had spun around with his own lightsaber extended in front of him in a sweeping blow. The Sith Master was there, deflecting the attack and charging him again, hammering him backward with a vicious series of piercing thrusts and jabs, offering no quarter. Twice the blade came close enough to trace his face that he could smell the scorched stubble on his cheek. The third slash came within millimetres of taking off his head. Trace realised that regardless of what Shackweth had said a moment earlier, the Blade Master didn't intend to humiliate him, to toy with him or prolong the duel any longer than necessary. At this point, the Sith Master was attacking for the most primitive reason imaginable, to slaughter Trace and leave his steaming carcass in the snow. In that split second, Trace saw the rest of the duel playing out in two distinct ways, neither of which would last long. Death was hovering over them now, like a scavenger, close and claustrophobic. He felt it reflected in the Sith Master's eyes. When the red blade came at him again, Trace jumped upward, 
He put everything he knew about Form 5's gem so variation into that jump, leaping over Shuckweth, spiralling through the flying snow, landing on the other side, and twisting around instantly, keeping his lightsaber at throat level with the intention of finishing the duel in a single stroke. Shuckweth laughed a bone-dry chuckle, and deflected the manoeuvre with mocking ease. He swung at Trace, and this time the Jedi felt a hot, bright stab of pain as the lightsaber seared through his cloak and tunic, slashing into the flesh along his ribcage. Drops of blood fell into the snow, disappearing as they melted. Too easy, Jedi! Now the Blade Master's shoulders and back were braced against the slouching stow wall behind him, its outer surface cracked and half collapsed. Now he tensed to spring forward. Now I shall finish you. As he arched forward, Trace saw a pair of hands shoot out from the broken wall behind him, gripping the Blade Master by the throat and jerking him backward. Shuck Weth slammed into the cracked stone, hard enough to drop his lightsaber, and Trace saw a ghastly white face burst up through the open hole in the wall. A screaming face, suctioning down on the Sith Master's right cheek and eye, teeth bared, gouging into his face. Trace took a step back, still holding his own lightsaber up, watching the thing that hauled Shuck Weth through the hole in the wall where it could more easily devour him. Great arterial eruptions spurted from the ragged perforation in the Sith Master's throat, spraying up over the wall and down into the snow and ice, painting the whole world red. Inside the wall, the thing lifted its face up and Trace saw its eyes, flat and without the slightest spark of life. Yet they had once been human, even youthful. A Sith student, he realised. A teenager. What had happened? The thing shoved its mouth back down into the ragged red cup that had once been Shuck Weth's right eye socket, slurping noisily. When it paused a moment later, the noise that it made was a high-pitched, ululating scream, and Trace realised that there were other screams, countless screams, a threnody of them rising up along with it, coming from every direction at once. The night was full of them. A real interesting couple of chapters there. And uh, also, obviously, back-to-back chapters. There you go. A little break for those of you who uh, leave comments complaining about the bits in between the chapters. I don't normally address those comments, but I thought for once I'll just say hello. And uh, screw you, buddy. Luckily for me, there are incredible people in the comments, uh, like Zach Marshall, who is another person working, Workforce Represent, says these books make my night at work so much more exciting. I absolutely love these books. I listened to Death Troopers and instantly jumped on. Thanks very much. Uh, Michael Mobbs here, who says, well, you've done it. I've officially got the Orchid's voice stuck in my head. No, Hastuzo! Yeah, sorry about that. I think even I'm regretting that voice. Um, But the orchid's really fascinating, and I want to know people's theories, because is it gone? It disappeared at the end. Is it dead? Did Hestizo put it through too much trauma by making it grow? Did that, like, kill it? But that doesn't seem right. Or did her doing stuff to make it hurt that much, has she forced it to the dark side? Is her actions going to be what make it quite so evil? And we have Guesthouse419, oh, just one off, says, uh, Love this channel. Like many others, the channel helps make a monotonous day at work fly by. Workforce represent. I would suggest the Star Wars book Cross Currents, supposed to be disturbing and would make for a great October read. Keep up the great content. That does seem interesting. I had a look at the uh, synopsis of that book, which has a bunch of old school Sith being flung forwards in time until like a time when you had like, uh, I can never remember the way you say this name, Jason, Jaken, Jason Solo. Um, like, and the stuff that he got up to, and it's after that, seems like it could be really cool. Um, so a definite possibility for the channel. 
But oh well, if I keep yammering too long, someone's going to concuss themselves on their steering wheel, so let's go to chapter 27, Paddock. Zoe and Tolk ducked through the entranceway of the long, tunnel-like structure, and the bounty hunter stopped and raised his head, sniffing the wind as if picking up on some obscure scent. What was that out there? Zoe asked, gazing back out through the way they'd come. Her own voice sounded distant to her, and her ears felt as if they were plugged with soft wax from the force of the explosions outside. Turbo laser, Tolk grunted. Heavy artillery. It's Scabrous, isn't it? she asked. He's looking for us. If the Whippet heard the question, he ignored it. A moment later, he sidled on, deeper into the foul-smelling recesses of the building. Reluctantly, Zoe followed. She was still processing the attacks, the laser cannon that had erupted up out of the ground, and the even more horrifying assault that had come before it, the screaming, undead things that had been intent on devouring them. The orchid, she said, for want of a better place to start. Tolk said nothing, kept walking. The smell around them was getting steadily worse with every passing step. It was the only reason I could fight those things off. It's because of how Scabrous used it in that experiment. I think it's inside their bodies somehow. I told it to grow, but... Zoe shook her head. It's not there anymore. Now I can't get it to respond to me at all. It might be dead. The Whippet responded to all of this with a grunt. You finished. I thought you might want to know how I saved our lives back there. You were the one that asked me for an explanation, after all. My mistake. Really? she said. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe you should have thought of that before you abducted me and dragged me out here to a planet full of walking corpses. No reply from the Whippet. Where are we going, anyway? Taking shelter, waiting out the storm. In the morning, I'm going back to my ship. The conversation ended there. Almost without meaning to, Zoe found herself reaching into the bounty hunter's thoughts, tentatively exploring his mind for some idea of what he knew about where they were headed. Normally, her telepathic abilities weren't particularly strong when it came to non-plant life forms, but the Whippid was what she thought of as a relatively easy read. In fact, from within, his mind resembled nothing so much as the trophy room aboard his ship where she'd first awakened. A place of death. A de facto display space for grotesque trophies and old kills. Some were alien species that she'd never seen before. Others were human. All were brought together in universal expressions of pain, desperation and helplessness that they'd worn as the bounty hunter had delivered the coup de grace. His mind had become a storehouse of their dying moments. This crypt of suffering, this reliquary, wasn't just what he carried around in his head every day. It was his head. Undaunted, Zoe plumbed deeper and realised that with some effort, she was able to pass through these thoughts into another chamber of the Whippid's consciousness, into his more distant memories. She saw faces rising up around her, others of his species, family perhaps, early memories from his home planet of Tula. The atmosphere here felt very still and long undisturbed, almost as if it were hermetically sealed and she wondered if she'd arrived in some part of Tolk's past that he himself rarely visited. Certainly, she had such places in her own mind, aspects of her life she'd walled off in vain hopes they'd die of suffocation or neglect. Zoe could almost feel the membrane that enveloped this part of his thoughts beginning to constrict over her. Then she heard breathing. There was something alive in here. She shifted her focus away from the older memories and saw the man gazing down at her, utterly calm and pleasant. His grey eyes were clear, sparkling with intellect. Wide, almost sensuous lips seemed perpetually on the verge of speaking, 
but instead they only twisted into a bemused smile. It was the Sith Lord. Get out of my head, Jedi! Tog's snarl boomed through the memory caverns around her with devastating force. Zoe recoiled, drawing back, staggering as she retreated, and looking around, saw that they were standing in a wide, bare metal chamber, facing a series of tunnels that branched off in different directions. Icicles spiked down like semi-translucent stalactites from the long, low ceiling. She couldn't breathe. It took a second to realise why. The Whippid had one hand locked around her throat, clamping her airway shut between his thumb and forefinger. His tusked face loomed just centimetres from her own. The next time I catch you in my head, he said, you'll lose yours. Is that clear? Zoe nodded, and he released her, allowing her to stumble backward, regaining her bearings. Somewhere across the room, in one of the adjoining tunnels, she could hear a high-pitched whining beep going on and on. Not an alarm, necessarily, but some incidental mechanism, maybe as simple as a light that had already started overheating and would eventually burn out. Right now, however, this area was still brightly lit. Presumably that was why Tolk had chosen it. As far as temperature went, the space was an ice locker, but at least she could see what was around and between each of the broad utilitarian pillars holding up the ceiling. The whippid turned, head cocked and listening, as he lumbered back up the corridor. Zoe, who at this point had spent a good deal of time looking at his back, noticed a difference in his gait, the way he carried his shoulders. They were stiffened tense with anticipation. Without breaking stride, he reached for his bow and started to draw an arrow from his quiver. Is this the way we came in? Zoe asked. What do you think? I think you're not sure, and you're trying to cover for it. She paused and sniffed the air. The feral, ammonia-foul odour was growing thicker around her. Are we staying down here all night? What's that smell? No answer from Tolk. At this point, had she really expected one? When she went after him, down the concourse, in the general direction of the exit, the lights were trembling even more erratically here, sputtering on and off for a second or two at a time. The acrid stench had become eye-wateringly intense. Zoe covered her nose and mouth. It didn't help at all. <coughs> This isn't the way we came in, <coughs> she coughed. <coughs> I would have <coughs> remembered. Tulk stopped. Off to their right, she saw a row of stalls. Something inside one of the stalls was swinging itself around, chuffing out volumes of air. Listening, Zoe heard it let out a low, restless groan. There was a silence, then a sound of feet rustling, followed by a bronchial, squabbling honk. The whippet replaced the arrow that he'd taken out and took a step forward. The thing inside the stall let out another nasal, braying squawk and thrust its long head outward. Its muzzle drew back and Zoe saw two pairs of nostrils, large and small, flaring to let out another blast of moist breath. It swung its shaggy head sideways, its curved horns nearly gouging Tulk's face before he drew back. Are they? Tauntauns. The whippet made it sound like a bad word about somebody's mother. At least it explains the sm- A thick gobbit of spit hit him squarely in the face, and Tulk lunged forward, wiping it off, meeting the tauntaun eye to eye. He and it were almost the same height. The snow lizard's lips were already working up another load of saliva. Zoe thought the thing actually looked like it was smirking at him, when Tolk abruptly broke into a grin. It was the first time Zoe had seen him express anything other than impatience and indifference, and the effect was disconcerting. 
Good girl. Tulk brushed one hand over its snout, ruffling the fur beneath one of its horns. I bet there's probably some mook fruit for you around here somewhere. Then, glancing back at Zoe, his smile faded. What? If I'd known that spitting in your face was the key to your good graces, Zoe said, I would have done it a long time ago. Ignoring her, Tolk returned his attention to the creature. You're a foul old girl, aren't you? He said affectionately. I used to hunt with one like you back on Tula. He glanced at the thick harness tethering the thing in its pen and turned to look up ahead at the source of another noise, lower and more dissonant. Listening, Zoe heard it too. The stalls in front of them were full of an increasing din, braying and squabbling, getting louder every second. Something's got them spooked, she said. Yeah. Awareness dawned in the whippet's face. I think you're right. In the stables, the tauntauns sounded as though they were screaming now, stomping in their paddocks. The lights went out. The blackness that engulfed them was crushing and total. Zoe felt Tolk's hand reach out and seize hold of her arm just below the shoulder. Stay close. His voice rumbled in her ear, and she heard the creak of the leather quither on his back. Keep back. Zoe felt her vision adjusting, straining after whatever slender traces of light she might find at the other end of the paddock. But there was precious little available, and what there was only created a myopic swamp of deep, grey shadow. She could feel her senses reaching out into the recesses, pinging off the walls and ceiling. Her pupils ached from trying to pull something of substance out of the darkness. Immediately in front of her, she heard Tulk suck in a sharp breath of air. What? she whispered. He jerked her forward so hard that her teeth snapped together, and all at once she was moving blindly, half running, half dragged through a black and sightless sea. The bounty hunter's grip on her arm was like a manacle. Swinging forward, losing her equilibrium, and then regaining it, she felt the floor skid out from underneath her feet. She wondered how he could see it all, or if he was navigating by sense of smell or just plain dumb luck. Then she felt them, coming up from behind. One or many she didn't know, but the presence felt massive an unwelcome intrusion of breath and motion and stinking flesh that bulked through the dark corridor, filling it. She heard a scream, a sound like she'd never heard before. It rose, a piercing shriek, pressurized and skating upward into the highest registers of audible sound. Thousands of vibrations per second until she expected it to burst apart, splintering into ragged strands and threads of individual voices. But instead, it held together, compressing somehow, overwhelming the cries of the Tauntauns and everything else. <coughs> Zoe sensed a probing, almost prehensile quality to that note. It was the echo-locating noise of something, some things, investigating the blackness around them with a desperate, mindless voraciousness. As quickly as it had started, the scream broke off. The Tauntaun's cries had strangled away as well, leaving a void of utter silence in their wake. Zoe drew in a breath, summoning the Force. What came next was a mental image, no longer than a second or two at the most, like a flash grenade exploding in her head. In that moment, she glimpsed the perimeter in front of them, the stalls and the space behind them. She had just enough of a view to sense what she had to do now. She swung one leg in front of Tolk's ankle, planted her foot and felt him trip over it, tumbling sideways with a snarled curse into an empty tauntaun stall to their immediate right. 
Zoe collapsed on top of him. The night vision that the Force had given her was already gone. She felt something long and smooth jabbing painfully against her cheek and realised later that it must have been one of the Whippid's tusks. What? he snapped, and this time she took hold of him, squeezing hard, digging her fingers as hard as she could into the bounty hunter's scaly, sweat-slick hide. In surprise, or maybe realisation, he went quiet. The events of the next few moments weren't simply a matter of sound or smell, but some collusion of both sensory and extrasensory perception. With the force guiding her, Zoe realised that she could feel the stalls alongside them, still pitch black, filling with the noxious stirrings of many bodies, packed close together, piling past, searching. At one point, Zoe sensed them lumbering by so closely that if she'd reached one hand out of the stall, she could have touched them. And they could have touched her. They weren't screaming now, weren't even breathing. Instead, the things, whatever they were, made little incidental grunting noises, the sound of bodies pushing themselves along for the simplest of motives. Hunger, hatred, rage. She held her breath, didn't move. After what felt like forever, the grunting noises trailed off, until all that was left was a putrid cloud that made her want to breathe through her mouth. Beneath her, Tulk stirred, straightened, and shoved her off him. If you ever do that again, I'll kill you myself. Zoe glanced off in the direction that the things had gone. Seems a bit redundant, given the circumstances. I don't run, and I don't hide. Listen, she said. We saw what those things are. I can't fight them off, and neither can you. So, for the moment, that leaves us with running and hiding. To her surprise, he didn't argue. Climbing out of the stall, they made their way forward through the dark, toward the strange, pewter-grey light she'd noticed earlier. It grew slightly brighter by degrees, until she realised that she could see the exit taking shape in front of them. The air was colder, and she saw the first big flakes of snow drifting in from outside. Tolk stopped and tilted his head back, the wind blowing the fur from his face. This isn't where we came in, he said. How do you know? He raised one hand. Zoe looked where he was pointing. It took her a moment to realise what she was looking at. Once she did, though, she couldn't look away. They were back at the tower. And that is the end of our chapters for today. A very good video. We've had some great chapters this time. We've seen a pretty cool uh, Sith versus Jedi lightsaber duel already, ending with some uh, zombie munching, which is always nice. Which brings me to a question I want to ask to you guys, those who know Star Wars better than me. When it comes to the Force and using the Force to see the future, is there a split between the dark side and the light side? Because it seems in this book, the Jedi are much more um, accomplished at using the Force to see what's coming and to avoid it rather than the Sith are. The Sith seem to be just kind of falling into what's happening here, even though they all did have at least have some sense that something had gone wrong very early on. I ask because I noticed that uh, Trace, when he was in his uh, lightsaber duel, uh, used the Force to see the options before him, and it seems that Shuck Weth, the Sith Blade Master, didn't have that insight because he wasn't aware of the attack that was going to come from behind. So, if you know within Star Wars lore that there is a difference between uh, the premonition abilities of the dark side and the light side, please let me know. I would be fascinated to hear. Or any part of the book that you want to discuss, get into the comments and say your piece. Michael Ford has been very kind in comments and said, Thank you for the Star Wars audiobooks and love to all. Wishing you all wellness. Thank you very much. Myself and I would like to say all of the Fulcrum Knights are very happy to have such a nice message for us.
Let's say a last few hellos to people in the comments. Jasta Mareel said something that I thought re was really interesting. Said, stumbled across this while painting Star Wars miniatures. And I did ask what the miniatures are and said it's Star Wars Legion. So the Star Wars stories have really inspired the painting. And I'm very glad to hear that. Awesome hobby. Thanks for letting us know. And Green Brick Studios has been enjoying the Red Harvest audiobook, commenting, This is so cool! Thank you very much, Green Brick Studios. It's good to see you in the comments again. It's time for me to go now for another week, so my friends, please make sure you have subscribed, hit that bell icon so you know when videos are going out, and you know when we're going live. We're going live on Saturday. It's at 4.30pm Eastern, 2.30pm Mountain, 1.30pm Pacific, and 9.30pm UK time. So I will see some of you then, and for the rest, I will see you next week. Until then, remember, we are all Fulcrum.